Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Amjad Mahasne. I teach molecular biology at Georgian University of Science and Technology in Erbit, Jordan. Our today's topic is a very exciting one because it touches all of us as humans. And before we start, let me ask you a question. Are you identical to your parents, to your brothers and sisters, or to your even classmates or your friends? You probably would say, although I share some characteristics with them, but we are different. Have you ever thought why is that? Why you are different from your parents and from your brothers and sisters? That's the main focus of our today's topic. Let us look at the following photos and try to identify each one of them and see if you can pick out differences between the members in each photo. In the first photo, we have a family of a father, a mother, and two daughters. And you can easily pick out differences between them if you look at their hair color, their eye color, their freckles, their height, etc. Now in the second and third photo, we have an identical twins. And it's very hard to distinguish between them as they are really identical. Monozygotic or identical twins resulted from a single fertilized egg that splits a few days after conception. Their DNA originate from a single source and therefore their genetic material is the same and all of their characteristics that resulted from their genes also would be similar. In the last photo, we have a non-identical twins and clearly you can distinguish between the boy and the girl because non-identical or dizygotic twins resulted from two, two eggs that are fertilized by two separate sperms in a single ovulation cycle. They are no more alike than any other sibling set. We'll come back. The transmission of traits from parents to their sons and daughters is called inheritance or heredity. However, sons and daughters are not identical copies of their parents or their brothers and sisters, as we saw in the family photo. Along with the inherited similarity, there is also variation. The question is, why we are different from our parents and from our brothers and sisters? What are the biological mechanisms leading to the hereditary similarity and variation? And before we answer these questions, let us move into our first in-class activity. Now for this activity, I want each one of you to look at the following traits. First, whether you have an attached or detached earlobe, and whether you can roll your tongue or, or not. With the help of your teacher, I want you to record your numbers on the blackboard in a table, and I want you to answer the following questions. Do all students share one trait or two traits or they differ in one or two traits. What is your conclusion? See you after the activity. Welcome back. Obviously, you realize that some students share one or the two traits and others differ in one or both of them. We inherit all of our traits from our parents in the form of hereditary units called genes. Now let us examine the two genetic principles or hypotheses that account for the passing of traits from parents to offspring. The first principle or hypothesis is called the blending hypothesis and it's the idea that the genetic material from the two parents blends together. It's like when blue and yellow paint blends to form the green color. In this case, parents will lose their individual identity. And because the blending hypothesis does not explain many genetic principles, it is no longer accepted in the scientific community. The second hypothesis is called the particulate hypothesis, and it's the idea that parents pass on discrete units that we call now genes. Mendel was the first to document such a particulate hypothesis through his experiments 
with the garden bees. <clears throat> Mendel performed monohybrid crosses, which are mating between plants that are different in one character. Mendel, from his experiments, developed the following concepts about inheritance. The first concept is that alternative versions of genes account for variations in inherited characters. And these alternative versions of genes are now called the alleles. The second concept is that for each inherited character, an organism has two alleles, one from the father and one from the mother. A homozygous individual has two of the same alleles for a trait, while a heterozygous individual has different alleles for the same character. The third concept is that when only one of the two different alleles seems to affect the trait, that allele is a dominant allele and usually is represented by a capital letter. The allele that does not affect the trait is called the recessive allele and usually is represented by a lower case. The fourth concept developed by Mendel is that when gametes form, the alleles separate, and each gamete carries one allele for each trait. This is called the principle of segregation, or the first law of Mendel. Mendel also performed dihybrid crosses, and that's crosses of plants with two different characters. His results led him to develop the principle of independent assortment, which states that the alleles for different genes are sorted into gametes separately. To elaborate more on these two hypotheses, let us do the following activity. Now for this activity, I want you to cross a pure tall pea plant with a pure short plant, and I want you to predict, according to the blending hypothesis, what do you expect the plants to be in the first generation and in a few more generations. Now, in the second part of activity, suppose that in the first generation you obtained only 85 tall plants, and in the second generation you obtained a 105 tall plants and 30 short plants. How can you explain these results? What is your conclusion? See you after the activity. Welcome back. You probably guessed that according to the blending hypothesis, the plants would be intermediate in length. And after a few generations, we expect to see a homogeneous population of similar length plants. So in this case, the original plants, the tall and short, disappeared. On the other hand, and according to the particulate hypothesis, the tall trait is dominant over the short trait. And that's why we saw only 85 tall plants in the first generation, and we saw a 3 to 1 ratio in the second generation. Mendel's principle of segregation accounts for the 3 to 1 ratio observed in the second generation. So genes are our genetic link to our parents, and they account for family resemblance as well as differences. Our genes program the specific traits that emerge as we develop from a fertilized egg into adults. One would ask how genes can pass from parents to offspring. And to answer this question, let us look at the types of reproduction. The first type is asexual reproduction, where one parent produced a genetically identical offspring by just simply mitosis. And this is seen in lower organisms like Hydra, for example. The second type of reproduction is sexual reproduction, where two parents give rise to the offspring that have unique combination of genes inherited from the two parents. So genes are passed to the next generation through the reproductive cells, the gametes, the egg and sperm, that are similar in chromosome number, but they are different in the gene order. Therefore, genetic variation is an important consequence of sexual reproduction. Before we discuss the mechanisms that leads to genetic variation, we have to remember that mutations are the original sources of genetic variation, 
as mutations are changes in the organism's DNA that create different versions of the genes, the alleles. Once these differences arise, reshuffling of alleles during sexual reproduction produces the variation that results in each member of a species having its own unique combination of traits. Now let us talk about the mechanisms that contribute to genetic variation that arise from sexual reproduction. And before I will introduce these mechanisms, I just want to remind you that meiosis is preceded by interphase, in which chromosomes are replicated to form the sister chromatids. The sister chromatids are genetically identical, and they are held by the centromere. Meiosis has two stages, one and two. I want to draw your attention to two phases in meiosis one. Namely, prophase 1, in which crossing over takes place between non-sister chromatids, and metaphase 1, in which independent assortment of chromosomes takes place. The first mechanism of genetic variation is crossing over. And to understand crossing over, we need to know what do you mean by homologous chromosome. Homologous chromosomes are chromosome pairs that are similar in length centromere location, and gene position. One inherited from each parent, and they have corresponding gene sequences, and they usually pair during meiosis. This figure, this figure represents a homologous pair of chromosomes. We have two sister chromatids. They have the same length. They have the same centromere location, and they have the same gene position. For example, this is the locus for the hygiene, and we have two alleles, one for the tall and one for the short. Crossing over takes place during the prophase one of meiosis. This diagram represents a cell with a pair of homologous chromosomes, one coming from the father, the blue one, and one coming from the mother, the red one. Now, these two chromosomes are held together during meiosis by a chiasma. Now, through the chiasma, crossing over takes place between the non-sister chromatids. In anaphase 1, the homologous pair now will separate, and each will go to one cell. And during anaphase 2, the sister chromatids will separate and you will get four cells. Two of them will resemble their parents, and two will be recombinants. To better understand crossing over, let us look at the following diagram that represent a single crossing over between a two non-sister chromatids. Now, this represents a homologous pair of chromosomes. Each chromosome consists of two sister chromatids, and each carries two alleles, the A capital, B capital, and these are the dominant ones, and the A small, B small, the recessive ones. If a single crossing over takes place between the A and B, and that means a chiasma will form between the non-sister chromatids, we will end up having two parental chromosomes, they have the original alleles, the A capital, B capital, and the A small, B small, and two new alleles, uh, the A capital, B small, and the A small, B capital, and these are the results of a crossing over between the A and B. We will take a break, and I will see you after that. Welcome back. Now I will talk about the second mechanism that results in genetic variation, and that's the independent assortment of chromosomes. And to explain the idea of independent assortment, let us do the, this simple activity together. We have two pairs of colored pencils, a red one 
a blue one. We want to place these two on a straight line. So how many options we have? First, we could just arrange them like this. The red on my left hand side and the blue on my right hand side. So that's one way. And another way would be just to change them. So now the red on my right hand and the blue on my left hand. So we have two possible ways of arranging these two pairs on a straight line. Now suppose that we have another pair. So in total, how many different ways that we can arrange these? Now, four pairs. So we have two from the first pair, and then also we have two from the other pair. So we have two multiplied by two. We have four different ways of organizing these four pairs of pencils. Now, to see what happens during meiosis and independent assortment, let us look at the following diagram. This diagram represents a cell during metaphase one. As you can see, we have two pairs of chromosomes. Each pair consists of two chromosomes, one from the father, one from the mother. So we have two possible arrangements of these two chromosomes in metaphase one. This arrangement where the paternal chromosomes on one side and the maternal chromosomes on the other side, or we could have this arrangement where we shuffled the lower pair. Now, if we go back to the first possibility, during metaphase two, we would expect to see the separated homolog homologs to be aligned in metaphase two, where we have a cell with the paternal chromosomes and the other cell with the maternal chromosomes. And the four different daughter cells that are resulted after anaphase two would have the paternal chromosomes and two would have the maternal chromosomes. Now on the second possibility, in metaphase two, we would expect to see a one paternal chromosome and one maternal chromosome in one cell. And as a result, we would have four cells. Two of them would have a one chromosome from the father, one chromosome from the mother. Same thing for the other cell. So independent assortment results because each homologous pair of chromosomes is positioned independently of the other pair in metaphase one in meiosis. Each daughter cell represent one outcome of all the possible combination of the maternal and paternal chromosomes. And the number of possible combinations formed by meiosis would be equivalent to four. Two possible arrangement for the first pair multiplied by two for the second pair. Now, only two of the four combination of daughter cells within the figure would result from meiosis of a single diploid cell because a single parent cell would have one or the other possible chromosomal arrangement at metaphase one, but not both of them. However, the population of daughter cells resulting from meiosis of a large number of diploid cells contains all four types in approximately equal numbers. Now the last mechanism that contribute to genetic variation results from random fertilization of gametes. As you saw, each gamete has a unique set of combination of genes as a result of crossing over and independent assortment. So a male gamete can fertilize any of the female gametes. The fertilization between a male gamete and a female gamete occurs randomly. As a result, each zygote is unique and hence variation occurs due to the different combination of genes from the male and female gametes. Before we do the last activity together, I want you to calculate the probability that two individuals will have the same genetic makeup knowing that 
the diploid number of chromosomes in human is 46 uh, chromosomes. I will give you some times for that, and I will see you after this pause. We'll come back. To calculate the probability for two individuals to have the same genetic material, we, know we need to calculate the total number of combinations resulted from the three mechanisms that we discussed. The crossing over, the independent assortment of chromosomes, and the random fertilization. In human, we have 46 chromosomes. So this means that the 2n is equal to 46. And the haploid number would be 23. So each gamete would have 23 chromosomes. So we have two gametes, the sperm and the egg. Now in each gamete, the two mechanisms that result in different combinations are the crossing over and the independent assortment of chromosomes. So in sperm, the number of combinations resulted from crossing over would equal to 2 to power 23 multiplied by the number resulted from independent assortment, which is again 2 to power 23. Same thing also in the egg. So we have 2 to power 23 multiplied by 2 to power 23. Now, as a result of fertilization, also it's random. So we multiply the, uh, the two numbers. So here we have 2 to power 46 multiplied by 2 to power 46. And that will give you 2 to power 92. So we have 2 to power 92 different combinations. Now the probability of having one combination out of these would be equal to 1 over 2 to power 92. The chances that our two individuals would have the same genetic material is 1 over 2 to power 92, and this is really low. I hope you have enjoyed learning about mechanisms of genetic variation, and hopefully now you know why you are different from your parents and from your brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for your time and for your energy. Bye-bye. Hello, this is Amjad again. Let me first thank you for choosing to do this module. I hope you and your student enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. First of all, the material we are going to cover deals with genetic basis of variation. Some of the material we are going to, do, to, to cover is new to the students and some they probably know. This module does not require many prerequisites. It, is just, it just requires general knowledge of DNA as the genetic material, as well as knowledge of meiosis, and that's how gametes are produced in the male and female sex organs by gametogenesis. The purpose of the first pause is to attract student attention to the topic by asking them to identify each photo and recognize few of the similarities and differences between individuals in each photo. The students will try to identify each photo and they will tell you similarities and differences between members in each photo. Also, you can ask the students whether other living organisms are identical or not. For example, cats, dogs, elephants, lions, plants, etc. The idea is to make the students recognize that humans as well as other living organisms differ from each other. Now, while discussing this, I will challenge the students with a question why sons and daughters are different from their parents and from their brothers and sisters. You can extend this to other organisms like animals, for example. For the first class activity, ask each student whether he or she has an attached 
or detached earlobe, and whether he or she can roll his or her tongue. Make a table like this one. In the table, you can just record the trait, the earlobe, the rolling tongue, and the number of students in each category. Now, at the end of this exercise, students should realize that an X number of students share one or two traits, while a Y number of students differ in one or both. And this variation is due to what they inherit from their parents. Now, in this second seg segment, the concept of genes will be introduced. Here we emphasize that the link between parents and children is genes, and genes are responsible for all of the children traits. After introducing genes at the beginning, the two genetic principles or hypotheses that account for passing of traits from parents to the offspring will be reviewed. The first is the blending hypothesis, and the second is the particulate hypothesis. More emphasis is put on, to, on the particulate hypothesis, and the Mendel work also will be summarized in this segment. The second activity is a classical monohybrid cross between a tall pea plant and a short pea plant. I guess the new thing is the first part of the activity, and that is to predict the phenotype according to the blending hypothesis. According to the blending hypothesis, we expect to see an intermediate length of plants after one generation, and in a few more generations, we expect to see a homogeneous population of an intermediate length plants. In this activity, the students should be able to answer the questions and come to a conclusion that genes are discrete units that can pass from parents to offspring, and each gene has two alleles. In the third segment, I started with giving them the answers for the second activity, then I start focusing on how genes can pass from parents to offspring through sexual reproduction, and at the end of this segment, we get into our main topic, the mechanisms leading to genetic variation. Before I discuss the mechanisms leading to variations, I will draw the student attention to the fact that the original source of genetic variations are mutations, which results in creation of alleles, and it's the reshuffling of alleles during sexual reproduction that causes variation. The first mechanism that leads to genetic variation will be discussed, and that is crossing over. First, I will explain the idea of homologous chromosomes, sister chromatids, non-sister chromatids. Then I will introduce crossing over when it takes place, when the chiasma form, and the results of crossing over. I will show an example of a single crossing over between two loci. In the last segment, independent assortment of chromosomes, which is the second mechanism that leads to variation, will be discussed. I will remind students with meiosis and show them prophase 1 and metaphase 1 as they are important for variation. And to introduce the idea of independent assortment, I will do a simple activity using two pairs of colored pencils. The idea of homologous chromosomes will be also clarified, and the possible arrangement of homologous chromosomes during meiosis I will be explained using a diagram with all possible combinations. The formula to calculate the possible number of combinations will be introduced, and that's 2 to power n, where n is the haploid number of chromosomes. The possible number of combinations in case of four chromosome would be equal to two to power two, and that, that is four. The last mechanism that results in variation is random fertilization, in which the possible number of combinations resulting from independent assortment of chromosomes and crossing over in each gamete is multiplied upon fertilization. At the end of this segment, I want the students to calculate the possible combinations which results from random assortment, crossing over, and random fertilization, and also I want them to calculate the probability that two individuals will have the same genetic makeup, knowing that the diploid number of chromosomes in human is 46. I will pause and give the students some time to think and come up with an answer, 
Then I will show them the solution. Now to calculate the probability, we need to find out the possible combinations resulted from the three mechanisms. Their crossing over, independent assortment, and random fertilization. The total number of possible combination would be equal to 2 to the power 23 multiplied by 2 to the power 23, and that's in one gamete, the sperm for example, multiplied by the same number, 2 to the power 23 multiplied by 2 to the power 23 in the other gamete, the egg for example. And that will give us 2 to the power 92. So the probability of getting any combination of genes in a given individual would be 1 over this number, 1 over 2 to the power 92. Hopefully, all of the questions of the students have been answered, and hopefully they enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed teaching this material, and I thank you very much for all of, all of your help and all of your attention. Bye. Thank you.